Okay, friendly reminder, you do have a list quiz tomorrow. Oh, God. You have a list quiz tomorrow, so make sure you're ready for that. You, it can be on anything from week one through four. So even hurricane week stuff, make sure you're paying attention to your um, Supreme Court cases. Jade, they're behind me. Are you looking for the Supreme Court cases? They're behind me. Okay, so we're gonna start with Baker versus Carr. Okay, I do want you to know that it is 1961. What world event is happening? What major event is happening in the United States in the 60s? Vietnam is happening fine. What else, Eve? Sure. Mia? Yes, civil rights movement is happening, ladies and gentlemen. Civil rights. Now, we will have uh, things dealing with all the things you mentioned, but this one is really going to deal with civil rights. Okay, so it's in 1961. You should be thinking of big time periods here. You need to know this is all about political uh, representation. Okay, Charles W. Baker and other Tennessee citizens allege that a 1901 law designed to apportion, what does apportion mean? What do we got, Katie? Divide what? You're correct, but it's to divide what? The districts to create seats, correct? Okay, so apportionment is divide the state into seats based on census, okay? So, Charles W. Baker and other Tennessee, uh, Tennessee citizens allege the 1901 law designed to apportion the seats for the state's General Assembly Okay, was virtually ignored. Baker's suit detailed how Tennessee's reapportionment efforts, okay, reapportionment means they're changing seats, effort ignored significant economic growth and population shifts within the state. So when a population moves, So do the seats. Okay, now this is Tennessee in 1961. What do you think is a major factor in this court case, Haley? It's 1961 in Tennessee, southern state. Now, the North has its own problems. This is about black rights, black voting rights. Okay, now. Who traditionally has power in Tennessee all the time? White people, yes? Do white people live in cities or do they live in rural areas? Rural. Rural areas is typically where white votes are typically found. Even today in 2023, most white people live in more rural areas while black, Hispanic, Latino, and Asian live in cities. So... They didn't want to shift the power from their agricultural or rural into the city. So they're trying to keep who with more power, white or black people? White people. By keeping the votes out in the rural districts, you are allowing white people to have more votes while the black, Hispanic, Asians in the city have less vote. Okay, that is what this is all about. It is all about black voting rights and racial equality of voting. Okay, so did the Supreme Court have jurisdiction over questions of legislative apportionment? Legislative apportionment is a state's issue. Okay, it's a state's issue. So does the Supreme Court, does the federal government have the right to challenge how a state runs itself? Yes, it does. In an opinion which explored the nature of political questions or state powers and the appropriateness of court action in them, the court held that there was no such question to be answered in this case and that legislative apportionment was a justicable issue or one to be, uh, justicable issue means addressed by a court. 
So can you take a state to court over how they apportion seats? And the answer is yes, you can. In his majority opinion, Justin Brennan provided past examples in which the court had intervened to correct institutional violations in matters pertaining to state administration and the offices through whom state affairs are con conducted. Brennan concluded that the 14th Amendment, oh my goodness, it always comes up. Equal protection issues, which Baker and others raised in this case, merited judicial evaluation. Okay, so you need to know that if it's a constitutional violation, it's ignoring Tennessee apportionment is a violation. Okay, so by not using the census and not following where the population change, it's a constitutional crime, which means the Supreme Court does have jurisdiction on it. Here we go. So what is the impact of this case? This is where the doctrine, in quote, one vote, one person end quote comes from and make sure no votes count more than others okay so in this case the people outside of the cities, the white people in the rural parts of Tennessee wanted to have more power and more votes than the people inside the cities, the black, the Hispanic, the Asian, okay? They wanted those votes for themselves. It is deemed unconstitutional because it voids the 14th Amendment. So what is the constitutional principle? It's the 14th Amendment. When in doubt, what is it usually? The 14th Amendment. If you don't know what you're doing, just write down 14th Amendment and you're probably going to be right. It, it says, in quotes, no state shall make or enforce a law which will deny any person within its jurisdiction to equal protection of the law. Essentially, Tennessee wanted to give white people in rural parts more power and more votes than black people, Hispanic, Latino, and Asian, and they said, nay, 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 because it's your responsibility to protect. Why is it important? Issues of the court were capital uh, J U S T I C I A B L E Jessica Bull they can parentheses they as in SCOTUS what does SCOTUS stand for? Supreme Court of the United States rule on political questions Many states had to redraw lines to ensure rural votes were not more powerful than urban votes. So is this a Tennessee problem or a national problem? It's a national problem. Tennessee is just the state that got caught. Okay. After that, pretty much every state regraphs their district lines in order to make it constitutional. All right, flip it. We're going to Shaw versus, Bay, uh, Shaw versus Reno. All right, here we go. This court case is in 1993. You people still weren't alive. 
fine. All right. The closest one we get to present day, I think, is 2001. All right, here we go. This is in 1993. Okay. The U.S. Attorney General rejected a North Carolina congressional reapportionment plan because the plan created only one black majority district, okay? Which means there was no state representative who were black, which meant... 20% of the state was black. So does that make any sense that there are no black representatives, but 20% of the state is black? So that's the original, like, what? Wait a second. 20% of your state is black, but yet no one in uh, North Carolina uh, legislative is black? Doesn't make sense. Think about it. How uh, did you know women make up 51% of the state of the US population? Do you know how many of us are in Congress, both houses? What percentage? We're 13%. We're 13%, yet we're 51% of the population. Hmm. Now, there's lots of factors that go into that. It's not just one thing. Um, but this is what this case is looking at. Wait, 20% of your state's black and there's no black representatives? Let's try to figure that out. North Carolina submitted a second plan creating two black majority districts. So North Carolina, it was pointed out, you only have one, but 20% of your state is all in this little spot and they still can't get a voting majority? That's weird. So they go back and they're like, okay, we'll make two districts. So hopefully maybe we can get two black uh, leaders. One of these districts was in parts no wider than the interstate road, which it stretched. So it was super like jagged and weird looking, like not like a natural shape. Five North Carolina residents challenged the constitutionality of this unusually shaped district, alleging that its only purpose was to secure the election of additional black representatives. After a three judge district court ruled that they failed to state a constitutional claim, the residents appealed to the Supreme Court granted a sanatory, or to hear them. Here we go. You need to know that lines were drawn with race in mind. Okay, Reno who is one of the lawyers, who is the attorney, U.S. Attorney General, by the way, worked for Clinton. Reno argued they were trying to help black residents gain representation. Okay, so that's what they were trying to do. So the question is, did North Carolina residents claim that the state racially gerrymandered districts raise a valid constitutional issue? The answer is yes. Okay. The court held that although North Carolina's reapportionment plan was racially neutral on its face, the resulting district shape was bizarre enough to suggest it was constituted in an effort to separate voters into different race uh, districts based on race. The unusual district, while perhaps created by noble intentions, seemed to exceed what is reasonably necessary to avoid racial imbalances. After concluding the residents' claim did give rise to equal protection challenge, the court remanded, adding that in absence of contradictory evidence, the district court would have to decide whether or not a compelling governmental interest justified North Carolina Island's plan. What you need to know is that the court ruled even though noble, intentions, lines were drawn with race in mind, were unconstitutional. Okay, so now, of course, in this case, they're trying to help the blacks in North Carolina, correct? 
Now, if we're trying to help them, the next administration could try to hurt them. And that's why they said you cannot do it. So even though they're trying to help, um, it, if you can weaponize it to help, you can also weaponize it to hurt, which is why it gets banned. All right, so what's the impact? It was trying to rectify oppression of black residents in the U.S., but the Constitution is supposed to be colorblind. Okay, what's the constitutional? Of course it's a 14th Amendment because it's typically always a 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment is all about the equal protection clause. Shaw stated that it violated because it was only drawn on race. Reno arrow equal protection was to attempt to help black residents. Why is it important? It sets a precedent that you cannot draw districts with only the same race in voting districts. Okay, now there's a reason why I'm teaching you Baker versus Carr on the same day. Okay, this was done to Baker versus Carr is to abuse apportionments. Yes, Shaw versus Reno is to stop abuses based on race. So it's on both sides of the coin. One is to try to help minorities gain power, and it got shut down because the Constitution's colorblind. This one, by the way, you have two minutes to submit these on Canvas. Baker versus Carr is used uh, to punish blacks, Latinos, and Hispanics in the cities. So these are taught on the same day, so you can kind of see the juxtaposition. One's in 1901, one's in 1993. Uh, you can kind of see how racial relations are playing a major role in how we are structuring our voting districts, and it continues to play. Okay, you have about one minute. After that minute, we are going to shift to your notebook. We're going to do a lecture. Let's go. If you don't get it submitted in the next minute, it's totally fine. Um, you just need to get it done before Thursday because starting next Thursday, I'm doing official deadlines. And you'll start losing points for not having things turned in on time. Isn't that exciting? Oh, I love keeping things moving here. You've got about 30 seconds. Three, two, okay, good. One, okay. 
If you have not submitted, it is now your responsibility to submit, not mine. You need to do it before Thursday. Everyone should have their notebook open. You should write week four at the top. Write legislative branch, please. On the top of your notebook, right, week four, right, legislative branch, please. Okay, you need to know that the legislative branch has a nickname, so right, legislative branch nickname, and what is that nickname, Tatum? Oh my goodness, you've actually used it probably. What is this nickname? Ah, uh, what do you got, Ellie, if you had to guess? Starts with a C? Aw, oh, man. It's not really a trick question, I swear. Luke. Congress. Have you heard that term before? Yeah, it's Congress. So, I need you to know. Good thing I covered that today. Okay, you need to know the legislative branch has a nickname. It's called Congress. So, what is Congress? Here's a couple things you need to know about it. It's bicameral, which means it has two houses. You need to know the two houses are the House of Representatives, which is the low house. Then you have the upper house, which is the Senate. You should write this down, because I'm expecting you to know it from here on out. Okay, you need to know, because there are two houses, that they are separate from each other. And this is the nuance that you need to know from the lectures. That they are separate from each other, which means, do they interact a lot or not really? Not really. They coincide. They're doing a lot of the same things at the same time, but they're not directly interacting. They only interact in two ways. Write it down. They only interact in two ways. Joint committees. And what is a joint committee? What is a joint committee? It was on your focus. What's a joint committee, Eve? There you go. A committee that's made up of both houses. So it has both senators and representatives on it. So that's one way they work together. Okay. And then they have another committee. What is this third, uh, second committee that has both members? They're trying to work on approving. Eve. Conventional. 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 Okay. Where they look at versions of a bill and try to figure out one that will pass both houses. Write it down, a conventional committee. Those are really the only two ways they interact. Okay, conventional committee, because you don't have to write this down, just listen. The House of Representatives is usually drafting all the laws that will go through, okay? So the House decides that they wanna make increased teacher pay. And aren't we all passionate about that? We aren't, we? I know we are. Okay, so the House of Representatives is going to come up with a bill that we're going to give teachers a 100% pay bonus. That sounds nice. Okay, so what it does, it's going to go through the House, then it's going to go through the Senate. Once it goes through the Senate, they're going to change it a little bit, then they're going to go to a conventional committee. The conventional committee takes what the Senate passed and what the House passed, smash it together, and then it's gonna go back to the House and the House can vote on the final bill, whether they'll sign it or not. If they sign it, then it goes to the Senate. If it doesn't sign in the House, it's dead. If it signs through the House and it signs through the Senate, then it becomes law, unless the President vetoes it. But we'll get to that in a little bit, okay? So there's only two ways the House really interacts. They're mostly uh, separate from each other, except in really two committees, joint committees, and there's a bunch of joint committees, and conventional committees, you need to know that. Okay, let's start with the House of Representatives. That's your uh, subheading. You need to know it's the low house. It's called the people's house. Why is it called the people's house, Tula? It's based on population, write it down. It's based on population. Okay, it's known as the People's House and it's based on population. Okay, how, what tool do we use to find out population changes? What tool, Luke? Census, write it down. The census dictates what A word? Apportionment, write it down. The census dictates apportionment or districting of seats. Okay, now, how often does the census occur, Anna? 
Give me a shot. It's a nice round number. It's pretty year. Two, no, that's not a pretty year. What do we got? Oliver. Ten years. Write it down. So reapportionment happens every ten years. So the lot um the last uh, census was in 2020. It was actually the first one I got to participate in. It was very fun, very long paperwork. And since um, we actually filled out our, our census information quickly, they sent us the second interview, which isn't always given out. Um, so, shut. Sure. Anyway, so the last one was in 2020. When's the next one? 2030. 2030 is the next one, okay? So we still got quite some time before we get that one. Okay, so you need to know the census is every 10 years. You need to know it's based on following uh, the population, which is all the apportionment that goes to the house. You need to know that the house is made up of 435 members. And those members shift with population. of the census. So can states lose seats in the house? No. Yes, write it down. Pop, uh, states can lose seats in the house. Can states earn seats in the house? Yes, but the max is 435. So you need to know that every 10 years, there's a huge shift. Some states are gaining, some states are losing. Which state Give me a state that's definitely going to pick up some seats in the house. Florida, yes. Florida is gaining lots of seats. What state is probably going to lose some seats? California, New York, right? Don't they all live here now? Okay. So with that being said, states are going to ebb and flow. And so the uh, apportionment or reapportionment, because we're shifting the seats, are going to change because of that census every 10 years. So everyone got a grasp on it. Okay, put a big star. This is a non-negotiable. The House of Representatives and state legislatures, write it down, are the only ones that benefit from gerrymandering. Oh, shit. Put a big star at the end of it. It's a big deal. So, House of Representatives and uh, state legislatures are the only ones to benefit from gerrymandering. But before we can talk about why that's the case, we need to understand what gerrymandering is. Liam, what is gerrymandering? Uh, I don't know. Okay, cool. That answer is a terrible answer, and I will not accept it. I've been watching you. I don't know if you know, we sit two feet apart from each other. So you need to do better, yes? What is January Mandarin? I'm fine with wrong answers, but no answers is not tolerable. Speak to me after class. What do we got? Ryan. Yes, write it down. Gerrymandering is when a party moves lines for their own benefit. Is it common practice or very, very, very uncommon? It's common, super common. Okay, you don't have to write this part down. Okay, both parties do it. Is everyone clear? Hello? Listen to me. Both parties gerrymander. Both Republicans and Democrats do it. I will tell you, because things swing, yes? Okay, just like the presidency, sometimes we have a Republican, then it swings to a Democrat, then it swings back to a Republican. That's how things work. Right now, it is swinging very harshly against the Republicans. The Republicans have been caught multiple times with their hands in the cookie jar of gerrymandering in the last, like, 10, 15 years. Now, in the early 2000s, guess who was gerrymandering all the damn time? The Democrats were doing it. But of recent history, who's doing it now? The Republicans. So it swings back and forth. So don't go home and say Miss Bennett is saying that the Republicans are the only one gerrymandering. I am not saying that. I am happen to be telling you that right now, currently, there's four cases heading to the Supreme Court that are about uh, Republicans gerrymandering, and they've been found guilty on two of them. Okay, so it, it, it's a thing. It's about getting a benefit of reapportionment. 
And every, how many years does this become very popular to do? Every 10 years, okay, there's tons and tons of gerrymandering by whoever is in charge. You will always see the elections coming up right around the census. Whoever's in power right after the census comes out, you're going to see a lot of gerrymandering. Okay, here we go. So with gerrymandering, ladies and gentlemen, okay, you need to know. It is only these two people benefit. Why? Why are these two? Why aren't senators benefiting from gerrymandering? Why, Rinkus? Because they have to vote in every state. Sure. And who gets to vote for a senator? Everybody. Everyone in the state. So there's, there's no gerrymandering because you can't change state lines. That would be wild. Okay? So district lines can change with population shifts, so it's easier to make that change. Is it easy to move the lines of where Florida is and Georgia is? Hell no. That's why senators are not affected. Polit uh, politician uh, presidents cannot gerrymander. Okay, you can't do that because they're looking at electoral college, yes? You can't shift that. So it's only the House and state legislatures. Okay, <coughs> you need to know that your House of Representatives are elected every two years. Why? Why are they elected every two years, Andrew? What's their little quote here in the house? It makes sense when you think about it. The uh, House of Representatives is called the what? No, that's the nickname for the whole body. Mia. Yeah. The People's House. So why do they need re-election every two years, Mia? There you go. Uh, are your opinions the same as it was two years ago? No, thank God. Isn't that nice? Okay. With that being said, there are pros, cons, right? Pro. Uh, let's go cons. I like doing negative first. I'm a negative person. Okay. So having two-year elections, here are the negatives. Okay. Your representatives have to, work, uh, have to work to be reelected the entire time they're in office. Representatives have to work on re-election, which means where do they have to go every weekend? They got to go home. They got to go back to their home district, right? Because if people don't see you, will they vote for you? No, of course not. So House of Representatives, the major cons is that a lot of your representatives have to go home every single weekend to worry about re-election because the re-election comes back every two years. Second thing you need to note is that it is very expensive, which means you have to do lots and lots of fundraising. Okay, in order to run an election, you have to have lots and lots of money. Money is not, we're all not uniquely wealthy in our own regards. With that being said, that means you have to do fundraising. It means you have to throw parties, you have to shake a lot of hands, kiss a lot of babies, whatever. You also have to make a lot of promises, write it down. In order to do fundraising, you have to make a lot of promises because are people just handing you thousands of dollars and expecting nothing in return? No. So does that mean it's easy or hard to become corrupt? Pretty easy. These are all very negative things because when we send someone to Congress, we want them to represent us and not the interest of people who have lots and lots of money. That is a huge con. But the way we've sent them every two years, what do they have to worry a lot about? Money. So we see a lot of this kind of corruption happening. Okay, pros though. Pros. They have to balance their time in DC and in home. Write it down. They have to balance their time. So they have to go home, which means they're actually listening to the people. Absolutely. They have to go home. Because if you're going to win re election, you have to go home. You have to be seen, which means they're actually hearing what is happening. Second thing that is a huge positive about this whole process is that we kick out ineffective legislatures. Isn't that nice? Yeah, it's a two-year turnaround. If you show up and you are garbage, you're out. And that's nice because we don't need to pay a long time for these people to be in office. So that is the nice thing, okay? 
All right, we obviously know that it's easier to be a legis um, a representative than it is a senator. Why? Because there's more of them, absolutely. And that's the big difference between them, that there's more of them, uh, which makes it easier to become a representative. Senator, Senate is your next subheading here, people. Okay. For the Senate, you need to know it's equal representation, two per state. Equal representation, two per state. You need to know it's the high house, a.k.a. more powerful. Okay. You need to know they serve six-year terms. Why? We talked about this when we were going through the Constitution. Why is it a six-year term? What do you got, Tatum? Yeah, absolutely, but why? You're completely correct. What you just said is correct, and we're going to write that down in a sec. But why is it six years versus, like, two or four? Yes, and that creates what? Uh, that's very close. Stability. Write it down. Stability. There you go, Tatum. Okay, stability. Six-year term creates stability because these people are making the biggest decisions that impact the United States. Do we want some new guy who was super popular for a little bit, he has no idea what he's doing in there, or do we want someone consistent and predictable there? Consistent and predictable. Pre predictable, there you go. Predictable, which will allow us to have stability. The biggest thing about the Senate, it has to be stable. Okay, here we go. When we talk about the Senate, it has to be consistent. You need to know every two years, a third of it gets voted, as Tatum was just telling us. Okay, so every two years, a third of that chamber gets voted in or out. Okay, they're not affected by gerrymandering, right? Because it's a whole state. You don't need to write it down. We've already kind of talked about this. So let's talk about the pros and cons. Pros of being a senator. By the way, when I was in fourth grade, we had to pick what our dream job was, and I said I wanted to be a U.S. senator. So far. It's fine. It's fine. I'm fine. Here we go. So, pros of being a senator. You get to spend a lot of time in D.C. working on legislation. Why do you get to spend a lot of time versus representatives? Who can pull it through for us? Why, Megan? Okay, yeah, absolutely. They don't have to worry about re-election. They're going to do a solid four years in D.C. before they have to worry about re-election for two years, right? That's a lot of time where they can just kind of focus. So they can really work on it. And I love D.C. It's one of my favorite cities to eat. Have you ever been to D.C.? The restaurants are insane. Oh, my God. One of my all-time favorite restaurants are there. I love D.C. Anyway, second positive is the amount of power, individual power, a senator has is second only to the president and, oh my God, the 15 people, oh my God, what are they called? Executive cabinet and the cabinet. They are secondary only to the president and the cabinet. That's a ton of power, people. That is why. Okay, so right now we have Mitch McConnell. I don't know if you know him. He, everyone makes fun of him because he looks like a turtle, kind of. He's been in Congress for like 400 years. It's fine. Okay, you've seen a picture of him. Well, anyway, he is going through some actually deli deliver, uh, some de He's having this happen to him, honestly. Anyway, he's no longer able to speak coherently, but he will not resign his seat. Why? Power. And the people around him get power because he is in, so they're propping him up. Same thing that's happening in, D in uh, California with a Democratic uh, Feinstein. Feinstein's like on her deathbed and will not give up her senatorship. Why? Because of the power, and the people around her get lots of power and money, of course. Money and power are always, you know, interlocked. Yeah, he literally could not make words. 
He had a stroke. He, he literally had a stroke. Yes, yes. So it's not just one part.